Hello, my name is Farrell D. Moore, and welcome to another episode of Right. Uh, when today I'm going to interview author A. Karina Spears, the author of Paladin's Honor, to further explore her book. It's a fantastic read. You should really, really buy it and read it for yourselves. How are you doing, A. Karina? I'm doing well, thank you. How are you, Rick? Good, I'm fine. You ready for questions? I am. All right. Tell us a little bit about Jarek's gang of thieves and who's in it. Well, first off, we have Gemma. She's the girl who likes more extravagant things than she can usually find in town or afford in town. So she likes being one of the only girls in the group, and she gets to be flirty with all the boys. Then we've got Storvald. He's the called Stork. He wants to be a minstrel, but he knows traveling can be dangerous in the world. And so he joined the Thieves Guild so he could learn more of the tricks to what to expect so he can protect himself later. In addition, having more money meant he could get better instruments, and that would allow him to leave the town easier than he could now. Next one down is Corey. Corey's the youngest of the group. He has the best ability to get coins from people because he has big puppy dog eyes, and he looks all young and innocent. <laughs> he also does well to act as a distraction for the others when they're uh, casing the town and going through all the people's pockets. Right. He likes having the older boys treat him as an equal because he's a younger son and his brothers don't treat him very well. So having these other people look to him sometimes to be the main person distracting, the main person getting some wealth, he likes it. Okay. And we have Bailey. Bailey is a large man with baby face and he's a bully. He looks a little like Crab and Goyle from Harry Potter. He's not looking to be amicable. He's looking to be powerful and respected. Ah. Uh. No. Next one is Mitch. Mitch is one of the older ones. He's called Springer in the book most of the time. And that's the job he covers. He and Storvold are some of the oldest in the group and were with the Thieves Guild before Jarek joined. Springer has actually interacted with the real Thieves Guilds over in the larger cities. Oh. His family banished him to the countryside for other reasons, but he finds it a boring place. Even a wannabe Thieves Guild is better than nothing. He's still in touch with some of the actual Thieves Guild with his contacts and gets news when he meets up with them on occasion. Lastly, we have Lee. Lee is Jerk's second in command. They've been friends for a long time through childhood. Lee isn't very clean or very pleasant, but he's extremely loyal, and that makes him ideal for Jack's purposes. Ah. Uh, why did Springer's uh, parents, like, extra, uh, well, expel him from the city? Why did they expel him? Springer is gay, and while that isn't illegal per se, his parents are well-to-do and expect him to go ahead and marry a woman and produce an heir and have whatever he wants on the side, but he actually has trouble with any kind of performance with women. He has no attraction, and he's like, I don't feel like joining the temple of Dido just to be myself. Um, my parents have their expectations, and in this modern time, I can't be who I am with them because I'm rich and they expect more of me. So they sent him away from his lover in town and him running with the crowds that he did out of spite, mostly. He, he was so angry with his family. They okay. just went, no, go calm yourself down this, the country. You think about your proposals and get back to us. And okay. he's like, put me where you will. I'll make a go of it on my own if I have to without you. Right. All right. Tell us a little bit more about Jarek himself. Okay. Jarek calls himself Blackjack in the story when he's working, and originally he was one of the child thieves running under the lad's man, Kosh. Kosh got arrested a few years back in the story time, and the group was about to break up because right. he was their leader. And the older ones saw what happened to Kosh. They didn't want to pick it up. Jerk proposed letting him do it. Oh. The other, older ones weren't against it, and they said, okay, go ahead, Jerk. You feel like it, be, be fine with him. Being that he was younger, he was less likely to get as heavy a fine. Jerk took the name Blackjack as it reflected both his name of Jarek in it and Kosh's moniker because a Blackjack is this, another term for the same thieves tool. Ah, oh, got it. As a Kosh. Jerk's never been to a large city and he doesn't have a lot of life experience. He joined the Thieves Guild because he didn't want to be a night soil man like his father. Being a thief sounded better than collecting people's waste. Having the older members back him gives Jerk a lot of confidence and confidence is attractive. So he may be young, but he's got that feeling of invincibility going because he was only 16 at the time. He's about 18, 19 now. And he took up the mantle at 16. So he's filled with big dreams. 
while he's had sex before, it doesn't mean he's well versed in it yet. And he doesn't understand that what he's feeling is not necessarily what his partner's feeling. Likewise, he's not acting out of malice towards Mirabelle in the book, honestly. He just doesn't understand the problem at all or see his actions as wrong. If he would have liked it, why wouldn't everybody else? You know, Jarek made a wise choice as compared to collecting other people's waste. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I have to say that. Right. <laughs> his father does make a good living off and puts food on the table. So his, his family life's actually strained because of him. His father wow. wants, every father wants to be respected. And when his own son's like, dad, you smell because he's younger. And I don't want to be around dad because he smells. It really hurt him. And he's drinking more. He argues with his wife more. And he just wants his son to, to see him as old. Yeah, to see somebody worthy when he looks at him. So it's hurtful. And he doesn't realize how much damage he's doing himself and his own family life. Yeah, collecting somebody else's waste doesn't sound attractive to me. So I can understand, Jerry, better. Yeah. But explain Mirabelle's relationship to Jerry, if he could. Sure. Mirabelle went about in town and heard about the troublemakers and got curious about them. She probably approached Genema around the Silver Rushers Inn since they hung out there and right. met up for their uh, conversations or their planning for the next event, that sort of thing, until they realized maybe we should go off somewhere else. <laughs> and that she got, and from there she got invited to meet Jerk. The leader of the group had charisma and unwavering confidence, like we discussed. Right. That mix proved heady for a girl who's looking to find someone to keep her safe from the monsters in the outside world, and eventually they got involved. Mirabelle displaced Gemma as Jerk's girl, but Gemma was kind of interested in moving on by then, so there wasn't any animosity between them. Right. It could have caused a big rift in the group, but there was no waves because they were okay with just sure. switching out. For a while, it was heady for Mirabelle to be the bad girl, but it was already starting to dawn on her that being a thief wasn't a long-term life choice for her. <laughs> I guess not. She wanted protection, but it was coming clear that Jared couldn't give her much beyond just that protection. Uh -huh. And he didn't really understand her and he didn't try to. He saw Mirabelle's a prize belonging to his station and she saw him as a shield against the outside world. And that's not the best combination for working out as a long-term couple. Yeah, I guess not. I guess I would add, if the question were raised, what would have happened if Devin had come into the picture? Eventually she would have left Jerick and found somebody else that was more in line with her family's right. views and doing farming and things like that. Right. What was Jarek's master plan for his uh, gang of thieves? Oh. Jarek mostly wanted to improve the group enough to hit large targets, but he doesn't have a horse. He doesn't have a conveyance of his own. Nobody else really does. So he's limited to the range that they can walk to within a reasonable amount of time and not get noticed being gone. They're kind of a motley group of uh, thieves. Oh, they are. They are. He hoped that Springer would help them get in with the larger guild over time. Right. That or that he could hold it together long enough for Kosh to return. And Kosh originally was really good to the boys. He shared out with them. He trained them up. He gave them a sense of belonging that they didn't necessarily have at home. So they were devastated when he was taken away. Uh, I see. All right. Detail, if you would, a little of the town of uh, Heathrow and the gang's plan for it. All right, I'm going to move back a little bit for the history of Heathrow to Riverfield. Riverfield used to be the farthest tip of the empire on the edge of the Uncharted Wilds when Mirabelle's parents and a few other enterprising families went and settled it. And that was a couple decades ago. It's a young town. The plan was to settle in and provide a trade outpost for adventurers. They'd come to the town, outfit, and go into the wilds and bring back the exotic things, and they'd get to trade first and then send on to the capital. But instead, a stone quarry was found just a little further out, a really nice one. And Riverfield bartered with the capital and uh, beseeched them to put in a stone bridge to help carry the goods and things across the river. Right. Because if the insurers could get across easier, they figured they'd get that revenue going faster. Right. I mean, it's great for hauling stone or wood and stuff downstream, but it's not great when you're trying to bring a wagon or something across to go into the wilds. So they got their bridge but the quarry is far enough away that people start adding shacks and town stuff over there and oh, because they have a quarry uh, that town 
got better supplies. They had the forest that Riverfield also was bordering. Right. But they got to have the stone and they also put together a daub and they have fancier looking buildings that are more reminiscent of the capital or other fancier towns. Right. While Riverfield is log cabin and wooden structures that can look nice, but it's very little home on the prairie or little house on the prairie. <laughs> right. So they're like, what are we going to do now? Because now everybody's going through their town, passing through, not stopping. And Riverfield is going to approach Adele about finding a solution so they can get people to stay in their area a little longer. Now, her solution to their problem is going to be quite novel because she's a court seamstress and has never tackled it in dressing up an entire town before. But for Jerick and his gang, they know that Heathrow has a sheep trading event in the spring that draws a fair number of farmers intent on getting new stock. Right. That also means they're going to bring more money than they do on a regular day. They don't have to guess what day they're going to bring the crops in and trade. That makes it the perfect time for the gang to come in and hit the crowds because they can hide among them and there's more money making it worth it. Ah, I see. All right, describe if you would, uh, Devin and Mirabel's first confrontation. Right. Well, Devin came out from Mirabel's family going, well, this doesn't sound a lot like an undead, doesn't mean it's not undone, but she's running with a bad crowd, so he'll go have a talk with her. Comes across her in town, walks up to her directly, and doesn't know that he's disrupting their casing of a dressmaker's shop. So the other thieves are around there, like they they scatter. Right. Mirabelle's like, um, um, yeah, I'm just gonna brush him off and I'll do go off to what she wants to do. But she realizes he's going to be back or he's going to follow her to her friends. And so she's like, okay, uh, how about we have those questions now? Mm, she acquiesced to his request. To her, it's better to deal with him then than to have him come back when they're in the middle of a heist and he might not treat her so well if she's actually stealing and he spots this. Now, for those people that are just watching this video, yeah. that not uh, accustomed to your former videos, ah. can you explain what a paladin is? Because why they oh. reacted the way they did to Devin? Okay. In my books, paladins are not simply a palace guard, but more like Sir Lancelot. They are a magical knight and these ones are connected to religious orders. They follow a specific god and try to be paragons of knighthood. If you, again, go to King Arthur's round table, they're trying to be the best of the best. And when they do so, they create and gain the favor of their divines. Oh. And in this case, Devon is with the god Rise, who smites undead. Okay, this is why they had the bad reaction to uh, Devon, right? Oh, yes. Devin cannot directly arrest them. He is not a town guard. Right. There's a separation that's very important uh, in the book because he can call martial law. If there's an undead threat, they will do everything he says and any of the paladins of that order or priests of that order say in that emergency. But because that is such a high level of control they can right. exercise over everyone, they are not allowed to get involved in mundane matters and disputes unless they are called upon or someone's yelling for help. If they're yelling for help, you know, stop thief, someone help me. Anybody can step in, anybody. But if there is not a clear uh, request, they may not step in and cause friction between the local towns, guards, or the secular groups and the religious groups. All right, let's get back to Devin and Mirabelle's first confrontation, right? Sure. So Devin and Mirabelle, they go to the inn and they share a meal. She tries to look mature by ordering wine and Devin actually orders wine too, surprising her as much as she hopes to surprise him because right. she hasn't seen him really drink before. He's fairly stayed. So he finally brings up her family's concern and she gets it mad. She's angry at him and she thought maybe, just maybe at that point, he might have been visiting as the friend of the family that he seemed to be and has been in the past. Then he started asking her questions. Uh, Given how she answers him, she shows that she has plenty of spirit and emotion and strong opinions. And that's not what you tend to have if you're under the thrall of the undead or you are under a spell. You get kind of 
remote oh. or stiff and you want to disengage quickly. So he's, she's like, no, that's, she looks okay for now. Right. So he parted ways with her rather soon, but his words implied he'd be back again. Mirabel wanted to know a little more what he meant at the end, but she's like, I've got to play Kate Jerk. And if I chase down this pal, then I start asking questions of my own. He's going to ask me more questions. This isn't going to go well. So since both options seemed bad, she decided to go back to the meetup site with the thieves and deal with that first. Okay, okay. All right, explain the purpose of the resin power and how Mirabelle uses it. Mirabelle and Gemma are aware of how children come to be. So they have powder made of things like Dido's fennel and golden thread to keep from getting pregnant. The Temple of Dido sells a number of potions and medicines, healing potions and all that, but they also have things that can increase or decrease fertility. Really? Mm -hmm. It's very much the domain they're in. I think I covered some of the gods in the last video, but we'll go back over briefly. The Temple of Dido believes anything for love. Okay. There's a price to have what you want. So they help star-crossed lovers, but they their goddess also deals with um, how many animals are in the field of breeding. So your cattle, your sheep, oh, right. the wildlife, deer and stuff. She's actually a huntress goddess originally. So she dealt with life and death, and that's why the mortal flowers are hers. Right. So she has some abil ability to help them survive in a very harsh world and get their children to survive. The first thing they wanted to deal with fighting undead that were taking over, then they wanted to know uh, how are we going to survive, increase our numbers, and then they worried about their dead, which is Sigvarder, and then they wanted to deal with trade and luck, which and, and travel, and right. that's Anjasa. After that, you get to Bard, who tells the stories and records the histories. And you get Tatiana, who is the goddess of skill rather than luck. And she and Anjasa are always debating which one's better. Oh, 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 oh. Okay. All right. Now so, so we discovered Dido. So the Temple of Dido sells them potions and medicines for fertility or infertility, along with healing and whatnot. That earns money for the temple. In this case, Mirabelle and Gemma are protecting themselves from getting pregnant by using a powdered preventative. Got it. Got it. All right. Explain again what happened to Theobald. Ah, Theobald. I'm curious. One of my favorite characters. He's the one who started this whole thing. Theobald was a happy young farm boy who grew up with his childhood sweetheart, Sasha, and they planned to marry. However, the land's ruled by undead. And ah. one of the child of a vampire noticed Sasha and wanted her. So he took her away, was draining her, and was going to turn her into an undead. Finding out that she was missing and what had happened to her, Theobald went to the local shrine priest. They didn't have a Temple of Rise at this point. This was a very small town. They had not developed very far. So they didn't have the money and resources and people to support one. So there was somebody there to help with basic things. And so he went to the priest and said, what, what can we do? He's like, well, I'm sorry to tell you, this isn't looking good because we have to send a request to the, a Temple of Rise at another city. They have to review it. Then they have to send someone here and then they'll be able to address it. But I don't think they'll be here in time. Theobald was not going to take that answer. Desperate, he bought a cheap sword. He didn't even have one and set out on his own. He doesn't know how to use this thing. Staggers through the woods, nothing more than that cheap little sword with a wooden handle. He manages to find where that monster's lair was because he didn't go so far carrying someone else he's younger right a younger so, vampire right yeah he's a vampire but he's a younger vampire he doesn't have all the powers of mastery that his higher level one does so he found where the person or the, the vampire had hidden her and confronted him ah oh, you know monster i've got you and i'm unimpressed the vampire just smacks the metal out of him and it knocks it clear free of the base it splinters the wood and goes flying off and Theobald has just this hilt. So he stabs him, goes toward the belly and ends up under the ribs, pushes it upward. And that's wood. It, uh -huh. They both look down and they're both equally shocked. He has managed to defeat this vampire with a makeshift weapon and the vampire died. <laughs> it didn't pay attention to the handle. He just saw that was metal at top and just went, I can take care of that. No, that's kind of a cool way to go. Yes, it was. It, a luck roll. <laughs> That's what it is. 
cover it. The vampire Dari fed on Sasha and given her his blood. She didn't have enough of her own blood to survive this. The evil man should take her in his arms and they said goodbye before her heart gave out and she died. He does not have the ability of transfusion. He's a farm boy. And they don't have all this. If they had a medical person, there's a small chance they could have done something, but really her heart was going to beat itself though. You just tear up. Yep. So the thing is, because the progenitor vampire was dead, it didn't matter that she'd taken in the blood. It, it didn't affect her. And they did have the shrine priest and they did get the rise priests a little ah. later and priestess and they were able to make sure she didn't come back as a vampire but Theoval continues to blame himself that she died at all he's like if I was only a little faster I wouldn't have just saved her soul I'd have saved her physical body we could have been together and it was killing him he wound up sleeping on a grave he wanted to join her in death and he begged and begged for some kind of sign please what should I do what should I do he fell asleep on a cold evening out there and awoke to fresh greens under him the, everything had been getting hit by frost and suddenly these greens were brightening under him and they were covered in small flowers, the little four point bluet flowers. Whoa. Bluets grow in graveyards and such. He knew of them, but he didn't know what this meant. He grabbed up handfuls of it and was feverish from sleeping out in the cold and he wandered through town and was looking, what is this? Trying to match it to something and he saw a sign with it and it's the device of Rise having the four bluets on it. And they were they were just starting to build one. They had agreed to send one out there since they had encountered this problem and went, well, we need to protect this town. That didn't help him with his problems with losing Sasha, but the rest of the town would be okay. So he told them his tale and wanted to join them. And they listened, they, they agreed. All right, this, this is a worthy reason. Um, you, can, you can become part of our ranks. He did well there and his heart was healing because he was able to protect others from having the same fate he did until a dire battle in the mountains led him to seeing the ghost of his lost love. Now, knowing she's still out there and still aiding him has made him pledge to find out why. And if there's a way for him to be with her still, he intends to find it. Now, if someone can't come back as a vampire, they just die a natural death, mm -hmm. their spirit can still live on as a ghost? Their spirit is actually free and they should be able to go on as a blessed dead. But for some reason, she is lingering here as a ghost, which is oh. actually extremely dangerous because liches and vampires, if they're high enough level, can command lesser undead, including ghosts. So then they can be turned against their loved ones. So the blessed dead normally do not come down unless they're giving a sign or a message from the divine right. and go away. So this is a huge, huge thing that he's seeing her and that she's fighting off other spirits. She's fighting off wraiths for him because he's about to be attacked, being in the shadows before the sun came fully up. Okay. All right. So he wants to know what's going on with his, his beloved. Now, for your final question, explain if you would the line that you wrote. Um, maybe she couldn't change the past, but the present belonged to her and her alone. What about the past? Would Mirabelle change if she could? Uh -huh. This is when Mirabelle is contemplating the, what happened to her and Theo and Sasha. Right. Yeah. And her big wish is that she had spoken to her brother more. She was only 12, between 11 and 12, when this occurred. She wishes she could go back and demand he explain himself that she didn't listen to her parents because she's young and she's like, adults know everything. My, I'll listen to my parents and it'll all be okay. And the priest and pr priest says, you know, she's jealous of them because the clerics were talking to her brother more than she was. But he trusted her. He talked to her some, but she didn't, she's too young to understand the greater depth of what's going on around her. The great ramifications. Yes. She, she didn't understand uh, sarcasm and the bitterness in Theo's laughs when he's talking about, oh, they're going to put up a temple rise now. That'll be great. It sounds great. She can't catch it. She's a little too young. But she lost her friend, Sasha. She lost her sister-in-law to be. And everyone else is so worried about Theobald. She got left in the background. She got forgotten in all this. She's mourning too. So she was too young to understand everything back then and too weak to assert herself. Now she has more understanding. Now she has more knowledge and the self-determination to go and do what she wants to do. 
she the girl she was is giving way to the woman she is and she plans to make her own choices for good or ill and not let others make them for her got it all right well that's interesting uh now next week we'll go into a little bit deeper into some of the questions that are raised that it raises so uh this ends uh, our interview today but i'll uh, see you next time another week yes and I look, forward to it. I look forward to it too because this is very interesting now again your website address that people can get a hold of you at is acarinaspears.com okay and on facebook look for acarina spears or a dot karina spears oh, Either right. one to me. and again the publisher is white cat publications white cat publications <laughs> all right Glorious. So I'll see you next time then. All right. Bye-bye, Karina. Take care.